If you go on the Spider-Man subreddit and sort by new, you'll see hundreds of posts that are all basically saying, I like the Spider-Man movies, I want to read the comics, where do I start? And the most common answer to that question is Ultimate Spider-Man, which was a series that ran from September 2000 to April 2015, solely written by Brian Michael Bendis. It retold the classic Spider-Man origin in a more modern setting, following a young Peter Parker as he tried to balance his high school life with being a part-time superhero. But why is this comic recommended so much? What makes it such a good starting point for new readers? And why is it my favourite comic book series of all time? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> uh, just a quick disclaimer, this is obviously my own opinion. I mean, I love this comic more than I love my own mother, so obviously I'm going to be biased. <laughs> I'm joking, by the way. This um, this isn't my opinion. This is a fact. Spoilers for the whole of Ultimate Spider-Man. A big problem with the comics set in the main Marvel continuity is that there's just so many of them. Spanning over 50 years and 800 issues, Amazing Spider-Man has had many, many writers, which has led to some inconsistent characterization. The Peter Parker of J. Michael Straczynski's run is meant to be the same person as the one in Dan Slott's run, but these aren't the same person at all. Because they're written by different people over quite a long period of time, they act completely different to one another. And the same goes for all the other characters too. Ultimate Spider-Man doesn't have that problem. It starts off in a brand new world with no convoluted history behind it. It was penned by one guy throughout its entire run, which allowed the characters to be consistent and solely develop as the issues went on. In fact, I wouldn't really consider it to be a traditional superhero book, more of a character-driven teen drama that just so happens to feature Spider-Man. I've always said that a live-action Spider-Man would work best as a TV show, with each episode like an issue of a comic book. I can't wait for someone to just adapt this comic panel by panel for like a Netflix show or something. I mean, I'll do it myself if no one else will. Fine. Stop by that Chinese West Indian place, Wings and Chains, and pick us up some food before you come back. People have their gripes with Dennis' writing style. I mean, you either love it or you hate it. He is notorious for a style called decompression, where scenes are stretched out across multiple pages, resulting in a very slow advancing plot. And while some people complain about this style of writing, claiming that it's just so they can thin out the story and sell more issues, I'd strongly disagree. It's character driven, not plot driven, so this slow pace is rich with character development. Bendis' dialogue is very naturalistic. Gone are the days of cheesy monologues in which the characters just explain everything that's going on. Oh, my foot! Something grabbed me for- yeah, I've got fucking eyes, mate. These characters speak like real people. They talk over each other, they start saying something and then lose their train of thought. A lot of the times their conversations have no actual bearing on the plot, but it's not waffle either, it's just, it's relatable, it's human. And of course I can't talk about Ultimate Spider-Man without talking about the main character, Ultimate Spider-Man. I've heard a lot of people say that Tom Holland's Peter Parker is much like the Ultimate version, but I'd have to disagree. While Tom Holland is this awkward, happy-go-lucky kid who rarely raises his voice, Ultimate Peter is an angry, angsty teenager who isn't afraid to lash out with people when he feels like it. I mean, is Tom Holland the sort of person who would snap at teachers, or taunt Nick Fury about his eye patch, or tell the X-Men to go fuck themselves? But that doesn't make this Peter a nasty person, just more relatable. It's how a teenager would act if he had all these hormones going on whilst also carrying the guilt of Uncle Ben and the burden of being Spider-Man. He's still a good, kind-hearted kid who's just angry at the corrupt society around him. He doesn't stand for injustice and he isn't afraid to call it out. I see myself in this Peter more than any other iteration of the character. He can be a dick sometimes without meaning it, he beats himself up over the smallest mistakes, he takes pride in earning things himself, and he always tries to do the right thing, no matter how hard it may be. The Captain America of this universe pretty much hates Peter, he says he's a terrible superhero and he should probably quit while he's ahead, and despite all that, Peter still takes a bullet for him. 
He's not a perfect guy, he doesn't have a perfect haircut, but he does the best he can and he's genuinely one of my biggest inspirations. Well, fictional ones at least. While most of Spider-Man's supporting cast were pretty much one-dimensional characters in the original run, Ultimate Spider-Man gives them the all-star treatment. Aunt May, Mary Jane, Gwen, Harry, Kitty Pride, Liz Allen, Johnny Storm, Bobby Drake, and Nick Fury. All of them are individual, fleshed out characters who you get to spend a lot of time with and actually care about them. There's a whole issue dedicated to one of Aunt May's therapy sessions, and it works. It works wonders for her character and makes her so much more than just a doting old lady who tells Peter to take his vitamins every now and then. Vitamins, fuck! We see the effect that losing Ben had on her and how she copes with the grief. After Gwen's father is tragically killed, May takes her in and becomes the mother that Gwen never had. When she finally learns that Peter is Spider-Man, she takes a good while to accept it, though it encourages her to be more open-minded about superheroes, and when the Human Torch and Iceman find themselves homeless, she offers to take them in too. She's far stronger than other comics allow her to be, going so far as to pull a gun on Venom to protect her family. I mean, Sony wanted an Aunt May spin-off film, like, if it's to do with this version, then yeah, count me in, Aunt May Cinematic Universe, Aunt May Spider-Verse, Aunt, Aunt may verse Mary Jane is also an incredible character. Peter tells her about Spider-Man almost immediately, and she's able to help him out on many different occasions. While on the surface she's supportive of Peter, she doesn't like that Spider-Man is completely taking over his life. It's all about him, and he never asks about her. She's got a tough home life with an abusive, alcoholic father, and a mother who won't stand up to him. She goes to sleep not knowing if her superhero boyfriend will live or die, and on top of that she gets incredibly jealous of Gwen when she moves into Peter's house. This same sort of character was hinted at in the original comics, but it was never really explored like in this one. One of my favourite characters is Kenny, who starts off as a background character, one of the high school bullies and a friend of the main bully, Flash Thompson. But gradually we learn more about him, and his whole arc is growing out of Flash's shadow. Despite appearing as a dim-witted knucklehead, he actually figures out that Peter is Spider-Man all on his own, and it inspires him to be a better person. He stands up to Flash when he realises he's gone too far, and ends their friendship. He develops a crush on his classmate Kitty, and starts doing press-ups in his room to impress her. He's monologuing about how he's going to build up the confidence to ask her out and gain the respect of his friends. I actually care about this guy, I want him to succeed, and he wasn't even the main bully. He was the backup bully to the main bully. Like, in any other book, this guy would be in the background of one, maybe two panels if he was lucky. Even the staff at the Daily Bugle, who you don't see that often, are proper characters with their own distinct personalities. Random police officers and passers-by will have their own little quirks which really make the city feel alive. The slow pacing really benefits all of these characters, giving them a lot of time to grow like real people. And what better example of this than J. Jonah Jameson? J. Jonah Jameson started off like his main continuity counterpart. He was an arrogant loudmouth who used the front page of his newspaper to give Spider-Man a terrible public image. While the original Jameson had a burning vendetta against Spider-Man, hating him so much that he'd hire actual super criminals to murder him, Ultimate Jameson didn't really care that much. He didn't really agree with what he was printing, he just knew it would sell him papers. And he thought it was funny. And while Jameson started off as this wealthy and corrupt man who mirrored real-life news corporations, we soon found out why. Through a beautifully eye-opening speech to Peter, Jameson reveals that he lost his astronaut son on a space mission and didn't get a body to bury. He talks about the impact it's had on him as a reporter and he admits to some of his mistakes. He explains his dislike for Spider-Man, saying that his son was a hero and that someone who hides behind a mask isn't. It breathed new life into someone who was traditionally a one-dimensional character. Sure, he still disliked Spider-Man, but you couldn't really blame him. And while Jameson's opinion of Spider-Man kind of hummed and hawed over the years, it completely changed when Ultimatum happened. 
Ultimatum was a huge crossover event which took place across all the Ultimate titles. The evil mutant Magneto sent a massive tidal wave through New York City, killing millions of people in the blink of an eye. The event killed off dozens of fan favourite heroes, most of whom have stayed dead ever since. They originally planned to kill off Spider-Man too, but they soon realised that'd be a bit too much. Now the main ultimate story was pretty bad, it was, it, was, it was pretty terrible, but Bendis didn't let the crossover drag his series down with it. He used the event to shake up the status quo in a way that didn't rely on violence, edginess and shock value like the main series. When the tidal wave hits the city, Jameson loses everything. His wife, his home, his business, everything is lost in an instant. And during that moment of sheer panic and terror, while his office is submerged in the water and bodies are floating everywhere, he looks out the window and sees Spider-Man, diving in, trying to save as many people as he can, even though all hope has already been lost. And it is in this moment that Jameson finally admits that Spider-Man is a hero. So despite Ultimatum's many, many flaws, it is responsible for what is arguably one of the most beautiful panels in Spider-Man history, if not comics in general. It's mature, it's genuine, it's one of my favourite moments in all of comics and almost brings a tear to my eye. I love the Spider-Man films with all my heart, but they have not come even close to something like this. This was a massive turning point for Jameson's character, who from this point on vowed to do everything in his power to make things right. After learning Peter's secret identity, Jameson promises to never tell a soul, despite the fact that he would sell more papers than he could dream of and save his failing business. He offers to pay for Peter's college and gives him a job that he won't be fired from if he's too busy doing Spider-Man stuff. Jameson went from one of my most hated characters to one of the most likeable. It's only now that the original Jameson, the one in the main comics, is starting to like Spider-Man, and that would never have happened without this one. Jameson was just one example of how Bendis critiqued society in the pages of Ultimate Spider-Man. The media, politicians, the corruption of the rich, the education system, abuse of parents, bullying, what makes someone a truly bad person. The book constantly tackled racism, where it was disguised as mutant phobia. Mutants were everyday, ordinary people who would wake up one morning and realise that they had superpowers. Society wasn't too happy with this, which led to a generation of young mutants who were constantly ridiculed for being different. They were shouted at in the street, insulted, and even Spider-Man was mistaken for a mutant and subsequently shit on for it. Liz Allen, one of Peter's classmates, was a proud mutant phobe who took every chance she got to speak against mutants. And then she turns out to be a mutant, and now she'll have to deal with the whole world being against her. And if it wasn't bad before, Ultimatum made things ten times worse, as mutants were blamed for Magneto's actions against the city. There's this one panel that comes to mind, in which Flash Thompson is bullying his mutant classmate Kitty Pride, saying that she was the one who drowned in New York. And it is extremely reminiscent of how Muslims were treated after 9-11. Brutally honest and heartfelt reflections of the real world that meant the book was actually saying something, not just a fun, wacky superhero adventure for kids. I mean, one of the issues ends with the Green Goblin beating his own son to death, instantly regretting it and then asking one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents to shoot him in the head. Like, yeah, that's for children, isn't it? Spider-Man, woo! Genocide, yeah, racism, woo! Most superhero comics never stray far from the status quo. They don't have an ending in sight because the goal is to keep selling the book forever. But the whole idea of the Ultimate Universe was to take risks that other comics were too scared to. What if Spider-Man went out with Kitty Pride? What if Captain America hated French people? What if one of the bad guys had enough and used their powers to kill millions of people? Whether you think they're good or bad, you have to agree that the Ultimate Universe took a lot of risks. And what bigger risk to take than Ultimate Spider-Man issue 160? After a final battle with the Green Goblin, a gravely injured Spider-Man succumbs to his wounds 
and dies in the hands of Mary Jane, surrounded by his closest friends and family. His last words are about how he could never save Uncle Ben, but he managed to save Aunt May, and he closes his eyes knowing that the people he cares about are safe. In a world that was trying to be as realistic as possible, Peter's death made sense. Eventually, at some point, he was going to face something that was too much for him to handle. And despite being told that, Peter never gave up anyway, and he died trying to do the right thing. The end? Nope, <laughs> not even close. The Spider-Man story continued without Spider-Man. We got to see Aunt May, Gwen, Mary Jane, Kitty, even J. Jonah Jameson all deal with the fallout of Peter's death. And it worked because of how strong the supporting cast was. The series was relaunched with Miles Morales, a young teenager who got bitten by the same type of spider that Peter did. He originally didn't want anything to do with his powers, his father being a huge mutant phobe, but after being a witness to Peter's death and realising he could have done something, he realises the responsibility he has. I really like Miles, but that's a whole nother video. I just think it's cool how the story can go on with whole new characters, just because of how interesting the world has been built up to be. Like, <sighs> Brian Michael Bendis, man, just... Just give him a huge pat on the back. The story culminates in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 200. Not with a big action set piece, not with a huge dramatic moment, but a beautifully bittersweet issue where Peter's friends and family get together on the second anniversary of his death. Aunt May, Mary Jane, Gwen, Johnny, Bobby, Kitty, Liz, Kenny, Jessica Drew, and new friends such as Miles, Gank, and Bombshell. They hug it out, they catch up with each other, and tuck into the world's largest table of food. They take turns talking about what Peter would be like if he were still alive, in these amazing double-page spreads which bring back the previous artists of the series. They end up giving the leftover food to a local homeless shelter, and say their goodbyes on Aunt May's lawn. And in my mind, Ultimate Spider-Man ends here. This is the perfect end to an almost perfectly told story that spanned more than a decade. If it wasn't for that last panel, that tiny wee bit at the end where, oh, who's that? Uh, Peter's back? And now he's immortal? And so's the Green Goblin? And it completely takes away from Peter's sacrifice? A bit like Emperor Palpatine being in The Rise of Skywalker? I honestly think that Bendis was going to do something interesting with both Miles and Peter's stories, but he was forced to wrap everything up for Marvel's big Secret Wars crossover. So instead of a satisfying conclusion, it's just, oh, uh, there's, there's a black hole and uh, it's, it's destroyed the world and Miles is in the main continuity now and his, and his dead mother and uncle are alive. Like, I mean, what else is there to say? Like, villains, all great. Like, some of them have totally understandable motivations. Others are just completely mental. They all serve as a reminder that there are always going to be just bad people in the world, and it's up to the rest of us to stop them. In fact, I might do a whole separate video on Norman Osborn, just because he's, he's just that interesting of a character. I like that the Kingpin buys the rights to Spider-Man's likeness, and starts making Spider-Man merch just to screw with him. He tells Peter that he won't kill him due to the millions he makes from Spider-Man just existing and that the more times Peter tries to bring his corrupt empire down, the more money he will make from it. Oh, and also, the the artists are just incredible. Mark Bagley is... is that, is that how you pronounce his name? Mark Bagley! Thanks, mate. Yeah, Mark Bagley broke the record with Bendis for the longest partnership in comic book history, and it's no wonder he stayed so long. A bit like the writing, you either love or hate Bagley's art, but personally, I think it's great. When Bagley left, Stuart Im Stuart Emmonen. Emmonen. Yeah, thanks. Took over, and he was really solid as well. A lot of people have gripes with David LaFuente's art, but it's one of my favourites. Did I say that right? LaFuente. Sarah Pacelli is also amazing, having co-created Miles Morales, and Dave Marquez, who drew issue 200, is just... Uh, uh, just... 
just look at this art. It's so good. Also, I'm not sure if this was planned out in the beginning or not, but rereading this series adds a whole new layer to it when you know how it ends. Panels like these, in which Mary Jane tells Peter he's going to die if he keeps being Spider-Man, or Aunt May saying that she can't wait to watch Peter grow up, like, it's, it's, it's so heartbreaking. If you haven't read it yet, go read it. Like, like, even with all the spoilers in this video, I'm pretty sure the first issue I read was Death of Spider-Man, and I still had a great time going back and reading it all. Like I said, it's not really plot-driven, more so character-based, so the spoilers don't really take away from anything. Just, just read it. Like, the, the whole thing, like, you don't even have to buy it, like, you, you can just pirate it, like, the, that's what I did. Like, wait, n n no, no, I didn't, no, I, no, look, I, I've, I've, I've got this one here, like, see? Please, just, just unban me from the Marvel subreddit, please!